This time she took a lot of care and the pregnancy was successful. She gave birth to a little girl called Anne. But of course they looked to see if there's anything on the foot and sure enough there's the mark. Now you don't have birthmarks on heels of feet. What actually happened is a common way to see if Charlie's going to come back again. We'll mark him just to see. If he comes back, he'll come back with that mark. And he did. Only as a girl this time. And that's actually very common. It shows actually, yeah, they are coming back again. Actually, if you want to read more about that, Professor Ian Stevenson wrote a whole book while he's in Magdalen College in Oxford about birthmarks. And that's one of the things which he researched about making marks on a dead person to see if they come back again. So if you know anyone, or if you have a, a young child, and they die, you know, either before birth or just shortly afterwards, and you're looking for another kid, put a mark somewhere on their body, just to know with a pen. When you get pregnant again and give birth, have a look for that mark. If it's the same being, they will have that mark. Next question. <laughs> Why do enlightened monks and nuns disrobe? Enlightened monks and nuns would never disrobe. It's only the unenlightened ones, the stupid ones. <laughs> if you're enlightened, you can't disrobe. Is it even a stream winner? If you're a stream winner as a monk or a nun, it says in the suttas, even if the kings come and offer you millions of dollars, you will never take it. Because having seen the Dhamma, the Dhamma is worth much, much more. Even the most beautiful girl will not make you disrobe. As a monk, the most handsome man will never make you disrobe. If you've seen the Dhamma, that's it. You're a monk, nun for life. And enlightened monks and nuns never disrobe. So if you see someone disrobe, obviously they didn't quite make it this lifetime. But pull a mark on their robe, they may get reborn again. <laughs> become an Arahat next time. If I see light but can't, if I see light but can still feel the body, then is it the sunlight? It's a yellow colour, sometimes almost blinding, but the brightness was not constant. Is it because my mind is playing tricks on me? Should I go back to focusing on the breath or mantra? It is an imiter if it's really bright, because sometimes you can still feel the body. It's as if the imiter and the body consciousness are just competing for your attention. The mind is not that strong that it's too dominant. The five senses and the a mind about equal in amplitude, equal in strength. That's why sometimes you see the nimitta, sometimes the body, sometimes you can hear sound. They're just flying for whichever one becomes prominent. If you keep still, eventually the sounds, the feelings in the body will all disappear as the mind becomes so bright, it blocks out everything else. So it was a nimitta, just keep on going, be still, don't move, don't do anything, and it will grow. Yeah, Joe, would you like to... Would like to clarify when you said you ordained two German brothers and they were the only sons. Uh, is, that, is it that they've, they've got sisters? No, they've got no sisters. That's the only two children and I got both of them. Who is taking care will take care of their parents. Their parents are still very healthy and well, uh, quite wealthy, living in Germany, having a good time. If the parents do get very old, then the children will look after them for sure. You can still look after your parents as a monk. You know, just like um, <coughs> many monks would actually go and care for their, their parents. So if you are afraid, oh, when I become old, if my son becomes a monk, my daughter becomes a nun, who will look after me? My goodness, you have a whole monastery looking after you. <laughs> <laughs> it's much, much better than just having just one or two sons or daughters. Hey Ajahn, so it's need to ask. When you mentioned about the nature, that nature take its way, would that mean the nature is conditioned by karma? Okay, the nature is conditioned, uh, yes, it's by karma. It's, this is particularly the karma of letting go. That uh, nature has its rules. It's called dharma. It's like the laws of physics. That's the dharma of nature. There's the dharma of the mind, the laws of the mind. And that's what's discovered by the Buddha. Just as Newton discovered the laws of physics by sitting under a tree, so did the Buddha discover the laws of Dhamma sitting under a tree. The Newton was hit by an apple, the Buddha was hit by jhana. (laughs) (laughs) 
Ed saw the Dabba. <laughs> because of that, he, let, he understood the laws of nature, and so let nature take its course. I mean, not you changing nature, but let nature just allow the mind to become very soft and very still, seeing dependent origination, and seeing dependent cessation as well. Let the cessation take its course. To teach the Dharma, and then let go. If we couldn't achieve Nimitta in this retreat, is it because our virtues are not enough? Can you explain more of this? It's not your virtues, it's your wanting. Stop wanting the blooming Nimitta. I should have mentioned it in the first place. And then you might, <laughs> then you might have seen it. It's really hard as a teacher. If you don't teach those things, then when they come up, people, oh, this is nothing, and they go away, they leave it alone, they don't know what's going on. If you teach it, they get wanting and desire. It's so difficult. So I decided years ago to teach the Nimittas, to teach the Jhanas. They happen, they're there, they're part of the path. You can't avoid them. If you go to the path of letting go, you have to come across these Jhanas, you have to come across these Nimittas. People say, do you have to do this? Of course you have to do these things. And if you go to the toilet, you have to go into that room, first of all, where the wash basins are in. You can't just avoid the wash basins and climb through the window of the toilet and just sit down in there. If you go in an aircraft, you have to go through customs and immigration, first of all. You can't just avoid customs and immigration and go straight into the aircraft. But you know, people say, do we have to go through jhanas and nimittas? You have to, it's just what happens, it's a path. So because of that, then you have to teach these things, but to teach them with a lot of emphasis on how they happen, what the causes are, especially letting go. Peace. And then you know the causes. Okay, next question. The Buddhist teaching centers around compassion, compassion for all beings. Also, one of the eight precepts is to abstain from killing. What is your opi opinion and advice on the killing of house pests, little cockroaches, rodents, dengue mosquitoes? If we let them go around, they might spread harmful diseases, illnesses to humans and other animals, isn't it? Thank you, with Meta. With Meta to me, but not to the cockroaches. <laughs> You have to be very careful with pest exterminating. Because what happens is you start with mosquitoes because they may have dengue fever. And then you start with the cockroaches because you think they may have diseases. And then you carry on and, and uh, extinguish or rather destroy the pest. You exterminate the pest, which is your husband. <laughs> He's a pest. And then you go on to your other enemies. You end up being the great pest exterminator. You exterminate people of not of your own religion, you're not of your own race, you're enemies. You're the great pest exterminator, like you know, armies are pest exterminators. Let's exterminate the pests in Iraq. Let's exterminate the pests in Afghanistan. Let's exterminate the pests in, in... Get out of that pest exterminating business. It's not just rodents. That's what it starts with. Ends up with your husband and anyone you hate. So you can't exterminate everybody. We have to learn how to live with these things. You can't exterminate sort of the things you don't like in your wife or your kids. You have to tolerate them. You can't change and convert everybody to being a Buddhist or a Catholic or an Anglican or anything. People are going to have their differences. We have to tolerate each other and learn to be at peace with things. So the Buddha said, yeah, extermination is great, but exterminate the right things, not the cockroaches. Exterminate your greed, hatred and delusion. That's the pest in your house. And if you exterminate greed, hatred and delusion, your cockroaches will become your friends. The mosquitoes will never give you dengue fever. People get those fevers because their immune system is so weak. Many people can be bitten by a malarial mosquito or a dengue carrying mosquito. Only some people get the fever and the illness. It's not the dengue fevers. It's not the malaria person's fault. It's because people have got too much stress. They don't come to meditation retreats so they don't do what they're told in the retreat. <laughs> so kill the pests of the Buddha's pest exterminating business called meditation. We'll exterminate all your household pets of greed, hate and delusion. Fear and anger. One spray of jhana, or maybe a repeated spray of jhana does the job. 
Okay, so that's what you should do. If you have all these things, look after your house, keep it clean, wash all the surfaces, make sure there's no food left around, and then, you know, you don't really have that problem. Make sure there's mosquito screens on the, on the, the doors and the windows, and then the mosquitoes don't come in. Also, maybe have your view on gambling, more for leisure without much money involved. Aha, gambling. How many of you, oh, you all heard a story about the five angels, I think I told that the first time. Haven't you? Five angels, gambling. Haven't heard that story? Okay. This is a story I always tell about the dangers of gambling, also the dangers of prophecy. Because many years ago in Perth, a man had a dream. You know that one now? He dreamt of five angels. Did I say that here? He dreamt of five angels. Every, each angel had five big pots of gold. They lined up and gave him 25 pots of gold. Worth a fortune. It was one of those dreams when you're so happy. <laughs> and then as soon as he, re- he received his last pot of gold, he woke up. He was in his bedroom. There were no angels in his bedroom, but even worse, <laughs> no pots of gold. <laughs> of the two, he'd have settled for the gold rather than the Davis. But he realized it was only a dream. So he went down for his breakfast. He was very surprised. That morning, his wife had made him five boiled eggs and five pieces of toast. What's with this number five, he started to think. When he looked at his morning newspaper, he got prickles up and down his spine. It was the 5th of May, the fifth day of the fifth month. This dream was so strong, it must be an omen. So he looked in the back of the newspaper, in the sports pages, in the horse racing. He noticed in one of the horse racing courses in Perth, it was called Ascot. It's named after the British race course of the same name, but we've got one in Perth as well. He quickly worked out A-S-C-O-T. Five letters. So he looked straight away in race number five. If number five was his lucky number, he might find something there. And he couldn't believe his eyes. In race number five, horse number five, guess what it was called? Five angels. Five angels was running that, that afternoon. In race number five, at Ascot, A-S-C-O-T, on the 5th of May. And he just dreamt of five angels offering him five pots of gold each. He had five boiled eggs and five pieces of toast. It was just, the coincidence was just too strong. It couldn't be a mistake. So he took the afternoon off work. Before going to the racetrack, he went to the bank. To keep the lucky number five, he drew $5,000 out of his bank. He went to the racetrack again to keep the lucky number five. He chose the fifth bookmaker in line. One, two, three, four, five. That's the one. Five was his lucky number today. He put $5,000 to win on five angels. Horse number five, race number five. The omen just couldn't be wrong. It was just too many coincidences. The lucky number five couldn't be wrong. It wasn't wrong. The horse came in fifth. <laughs> Serves him right. <laughs> That's what happens with gambling. You can never know. Even omens. But if it's gambling, if it really is just for, just for this bit of fun. Because I remember as a kid, we used to, you know, play cards with my father. You know, it was for like pennies, only small amounts of money. And my father would always manage to lose. Instead of actually giving us pocket money, he played cards with us as a way of spending time with his children, having fun with them, a bit of you know, father-children bonding. And he'd deliberately lose. We knew that, but we never tell him. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just for fun. If it really is for fun, you don't take it too seriously. And you, know, you really are you know, relaxed about it, fine. No big thing. 
But be careful because sometimes for some people gambling is a disease. They, they are concerned about it. And they don't just, you know, play for, for pennies or cents just for fun. They play for the real thing. And unfortunately I know many terrible stories. There is a casino in Perth. I know some people who worked in that casino and they tell me what happens there and it's disgusting. Some people, they go there, they start gambling. Usually, I don't know what it is, they usually win the first time. And they think it's easy money, they keep on gambling. And there comes a time when they start losing. When they lose, they always gamble more to try and get their losses back again. They just go deeper into debt. And they say at that casino, there is some well-known gangsters. The police for years have been trying to nail them with something, they're just too clever. But they're hanging around that casino. When they see someone losing heavily, they'll give them a loan. $10,000, $20,000. They take this big wad of cash out of their pocket and give it to them. They know what's going to happen next. They will lose more. They won't be able to pay it back. So many of these women, they give them a choice. You'll break your legs or you come and work for us as a prostitute. Sex slavery. You see these poor women, they go there and they've got no choice. Selling their bodies to pay off their gambling debts. And they never manage to pay those debts off. Everyone knows what's going on, they just police can't touch them. They're just too smart, too wealthy. It's a hell realm. And it's just so hard to get people out of that hell once they get in it. So that's why the Buddha called gambling, he called it <coughs> like the mouth or the entrance to danger. A bayamukha. The entrance to um, very fearful and fearsome states. So be very, very, very careful. If you go gambling big time, you're lost. All gamblers are losers, eventually. Ajahn Brahm, it's exciting to see devas appearing on photos on these nights. Could you share with us what should be the correct attitude with regard to these photos in our practice? You can actually take copies of those photos, show them to your friends, but use them as inspirations for yourself to know that you've been on a retreat where devas were appeared and that gives inspiration to you. You can show it to your Christian friends. <laughs> because what it does, it shows them that you know it's not just in Christianity you get miracles. Whenever there's good people, there are miracles. In other words, uh, you know, this is uh, proof that goodness, kindness, loving kindness, meditation is a very good thing. And the reason why I say that is because I used to be a scientist, a physicist, and there's just too many people out there who are sceptical. It's not as if they, they don't believe or they've got an open mind. They believe that such things cannot happen. If you show them that photograph, they say, okay, I know, you all digitally enhanced it. You took it to the, the laboratory and you sort of messed around with it. But you can show it and say it was done straight away. But it's good to actually show people. It gives them faith, inspiration, which is good. Dear Ajahn Brahm, my friend's mother suffers from urinary tract infection. Since then she cannot move at all and is bedridden. Ridden. She is 78 years old, fully conscious. And if saying, how are you feeling today is not appropriate, neither you have my permission to die is applicable because she still looks good for her age. I want to talk to her and to comfort her, but I do not know what to say. Please help me how to be wise uh, to comfort her. You can just tell them what you've been doing today. Say you went to a retreat and you saw Davis on a photograph. So talk about Davis, talk about life, talk about whatever she's interested in, talk about the family. Talk about all those things you would talk to her about if she wasn't sick. When she wasn't sick, did you have anything to talk to her about? Or were you bored and didn't know what to say? So the important thing is, you talk to her as your mother, as you would talk to her if you didn't have that urinary tract infection. That's what she wants to hear. Have you ever been sick? <coughs> In hospital? And people keep on focusing on the disease or the sickness again and again. You want to hear what the family's doing. 
Just like if you had a cup of coffee with your best friend, just talk about things, just chat about ordinary things. There was a Tibetan nun who was dying of cancer 